Malachi, Nostradamus, and Mother Shipton all predicted events that have since become history. But who are today's forecasters, and what can they tell us about our fate? 8, 15, 22, 29. Robert Zola is a medievalist astrologer, a modern Nostradamus. For 30 years, he has been studying the stars in order to decipher the future, and he's made some predictions of surprising accuracy. America will have a new president, and he will be in the stamp of Bush, a younger, more inexperienced version from the same house. There is an increasing threat to the U.S. citizens, and this is particularly so on the eastern seaboard. If the U.S. does not cease acting incompetently, it will invite the depredations of adventurers such as Osama bin Laden and Saddam. The greatest period of danger is in September 2001. Sheer coincidence, or did the stars actually foretell the events? Number is actually the key to astrology. The sequence of integers between one and nine, and later the addition of zero, was seen by some of the ancients as being the basic principles of whereby being became articulated into something. Astrology rests upon this kind of thinking. The signs themselves come down in number. Why it seems to work is an enigma, but many ancient civilizations fervently believed that the stars and nature held the answers to the mysteries of life. The Mayans and the Hopis, as virtually all indigenous people throughout the world, were very connected to the sky. The Mayans in particular were very sophisticated in noticing the rhythms of the heavens and building elaborate calendars with great accuracy. The Mayan calendar, which was designed to calculate the progress of the seasons, was also a tool of prophecy. The calendar ends abruptly on the 21st of December, 2012 and Mayan prophecy describes bleak events surrounding that time. The face of the sun will be extinguished because of the Great Tempest. In a similar way, another Native American culture, the Hopis, have a prophecy that there would be times of great destruction, a day of great purification. These are the signs that great destruction is here. The world shall rock to and fro. The white man will battle people in other lands, those who possess the first light of wisdom. The fourth world shall end soon, and the fifth world will begin. The Hopi Indians, in their final warnings, are saying the world has been destroyed and reborn at least four times. Many native traditions say four times, and we're entering the fifth time. But according to many historians, these common themes in prophecy are nothing more than the inevitable patterns and rhythms of history. All prophets are predicting similar sorts of things. They're essentially talking about how history sort of repeats itself and you'll get the same sorts of things uh, in, in cycles. Perhaps. But there is one man whose prophetic and predictive talents continue to baffle even the most skeptical of critics. With only a smattering of education, he revealed secrets of the past. He predicted wars, diagnosed and cured illnesses, and saw cataclysmic changes to our planet that only scientists could have described. And he did it all in his sleep. For 43 years of his life, Edgar Cayce demonstrated a mystifying ability to put himself in a trance and give people around him detailed information about virtually anything they asked relating to the present, the past, or the future. Edgar Cayce is probably the most profoundly important clairvoyant of all time. He was clearly the most gifted psychic of, of the 20th century. Cayce predicted the Second World War, the death of presidents, the future of medicine. He also diagnosed illnesses and all in his sleep. His psychic readings, all 14,306 of them, are archived and catalogued at the Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia. They constitute the largest collection of psychic material from a single source in the world. Edgar Cayce didn't give 10, 20, 500 readings in his career. He gave 14,000. Think of a Las Vegas stage performer having to come up with a different routine twice a day, every day for 45 years. It's just not possible. 
Edgar Casey gave readings about many, many different subjects. Nostradamus wasn't quite as eclectic. But like Nostradamus, Casey was much sought after in his lifetime, and like his French counterpart, he also remained extremely modest about his gift. Both of them were men who were deeply committed to a life of compassion and service to others. Both were very interested in health and healing. Nostradamus was a physician. Edgar Casey was an intuitive diagnostic physician of sorts. Edgar Casey and Nostradamus both started as healers, but later became more famous as prophets. Edgar Casey's fateful journey through life started in 1877 near Hopkinsville, a small town of tobacco farmers in rural Kentucky. Edgar Casey's family was typical of middle-class American rural people at the turn of the 20th century. They made their living primarily from the production of dark tobacco, wheat and corn and livestock. They were church-going people on Sunday, a straightforward, dignified people, uh, the men of whom were certainly given to the heavy use of tobacco and occasional strong drink. Casey was a seriously odd child. He, he, he was not the kind of child you would wish on any two parents. As a child, he was surprised to discover that other children didn't have the same sort of experiences that he had. <laughs> As a boy, Edgar often had visions as he sat in the woods reading his Bible. After his grandfather drowned in their pond, he reported seeing him regularly around the farm. The child was also said to have had the uncanny ability to memorize entire books by sleeping on them. Had he been born in different circumstances, not a, a little rural community, Edgar could very easily have been you know, sold as a circus act. He was completely surrounded by people who loved him, people who protected him. Edgar's most extraordinary talent, which earned him the nickname Sleeping Prophet, surfaced several years later when he was in his early 20s. While working as an insurance salesman, he developed severe chronic laryngitis. Unable to speak, Casey took a job as a photographer. In the dark room, he wouldn't be required to talk much. But the malady persisted and he finally decided to seek help. At that time, Edgar had had some uh, friendship association with Dr. Al Lane, a homeopathic physician. And Dr. Lane suggested to young Edgar, why not self-impose hypnosis? What happened next sealed Edgar Casey's destiny. It was on the 30th of March, 1901, in a two-story brick house on West 7th Street in Hopkinsville, Kentucky that Edgar Casey lay upon a couch in a contemplative and meditative situation and self-imposed hypnosis. And then, before his parents and maybe a few others in the room, astounded everyone by describing what was wrong with his throat and prescribing treatment for it. The first reading, March 30th, 1901. Out of a deep sleep, Casey had spoken in a clear voice and described both his ailment and its cure. Soon, doctors and patients were coming from far and wide to be diagnosed and made well by the man with the X-ray eyes. One of the amazing things about Edgar Casey's health readings is the piercing nature of his vision into an individual's body. He would read the body as though he were an X-ray machine and uh, the terminology that he used was quite medical. It's quite amazing. In 1905, Casey told surgeons how to mend the badly broken leg of a local man, George Dalton, by inserting a nail into the break. The doctors had said Dalton would never walk again. He did. To our knowledge, that was the first time in medical history of the use of a nail. In the summer of 1911, when doctors told Casey his wife Gertrude would soon die of tuberculosis, she followed her husband's treatment directions and quickly recovered. Casey's fame as a healer spread rapidly. In the New York Times, he received rave reviews from doctors. One wrote, his psychologic terms would do credit to any professor of nervous anatomy. While in his normal state, he is an illiterate man, especially along the lines of medicine, surgery, or pharmacy, of which he knows nothing. The predictions were amazingly precise in their detail, but his...